My friend is the worst player in the world, which is fantastic, because my DM is the worst DM in the world. Though I barely knew the rules of the game, the two of them invited me to play with them. The rest of their group had left their game, and they wanted at least a third person, so that card just happened to be passed to me. This was all because they learned that I had played DD before. Now, I had only played DD a few times, and nothing recently. They were always spur off moment one shot adventures that I just happened to join in because everyone in my hometown circle of friends wanted to play. I never had access to the books and had to learn as I went along, leaving me with only a loose sense of the rules, not wanting to ruin anyone's fun due to my ignorance of the rules. When my friend invited me to play with his DM, I went ahead and purchased the core books and started reading them. Though they were dry and at times dull, I read them cover to cover, committing as much to memory as I could, using my past gaming experiences to help prioritize what to memorize. Most of you can already guess just how much of a waste that all was. Our DM asked us for 5th level characters, and I decided that even though I didn't really like dwarfs all that much, they were at least normal enough to be readily approved. For a class, I considered being a cleric, but in the end I didn't think I would be able to realistically portray one without knowing more about the gods of the campaign, and the DM might not want to put so much focus on them. In the end, I decided to play as a fighter, and named my dwarf Gyul Wernstone. When I arrived at the DM's house, I was a little taken aback by the setup for the game. We were playing in his basement, which had a low ceiling that was made even lower by black paper streamers that must have been from some party long ago. Though there were plenty of chairs, they were all pushed against the walls, with the cushions removed and spread around the floor along with other pillows and a few blankets. Looking all the world like some Arabian harem. Missing. Of course, were the beautiful women, but in their place my friend was lying down among the pillows, resting his head in one hand. Our DM strode into the room, settled himself into a thick pile of pillows, and beckoned me to come and get comfortable. I sat down upon a cushion, feeling nervous and awkward, wondering where I was supposed to roll my dice and where the miniatures were. Our DM asked for our characters, and I handed him my character sheet. He glanced it over frowned, and then passed it back without a word. He then turned to my friend, and asked what his character was. He started out by saying he had it all memorized in his head, and hadn't written any of it down. A bad start, my gut told me. The character was Leah Perabukanchaki, a wizard ninja. He said that he looked human except for his red eyes and fangs, but was actually a half drow half ogre. He then began to explain his character's history, an intensely convoluted plot that sounded like 12 stories smashed together. Though none of them managed to successfully explain why he was a wizard or a ninja, though I can't really blame him for also not being able to satisfactorily explain being a half drow half ogre. Our DM listened intently, asking questions about odd things how many servants did your castle have and after you killed your stepbrother, what happened to his magical necklace, etc. While I tried to keep track of just how many family members he had saved, killed, and slept with, when he had finished, I was starting to understand why the rest of their group had left. My head hurt just thinking about all the powers and spells and items he had mentioned casually, many of them which were definitely in no books and purely of his own creation. The DM turned to me expectantly, and asked me what my character's history was. I had decided Gul was a recently retired miner who wanted to spend his last few years living like an adventurer in a clumsy attempt at recapturing the essence of his lost youth, and I told the DM that, he waited, as if expecting more, but then turned away before I could pad up Gul's backstory a bit more. After jotting down a few notes in a tiny little book that was barely larger than a matchbook, our DM started to introduce us to his world, the world of Yigigantis. In Yigigantis, giants are giant assholes. Another bad start, by my reckoning. To express just how big of an asshole these giants were, our DM explained how they were honor bound to destroy any man-made structure that would allow a human to stand taller than them. This meant that the shorter giants would go around attempting to smash wagons, the larger giants would tear apart houses, and the largest would lay siege to castles and towers. We were starting off in the ruined remnants of Castle Kanchaki. In the middle of the night, the tallest of the giants had single-handedly smashed apart the castle, leaving only the people who could survive having a castle fall apart around them. Leah Peribu and Gul. Leah Peribu was pissed. Even his player was pissed. He started yelling at how unfair it was, and how he hadn't even been given a chance to fight against the giant, and how he was going to feed him to the spider queen. 
Until I decided it would be a good chance to try out my best dwarf impression. There's nothing we can do about it now, Gyul said in a gruff voice. Nothing except to seek revenge and recompense. Shut up, girl, Leopabu said. You're just a dwarf going through his midlife crisis. You don't understand anything about true pain. I was surprised by how much that stung. It was several different layers of hurt. I chose to ignore how he had pushed aside my well-meaning advice. How he had insulted my character's backstory. How he claimed that only his demented character understood pain. And how he had given my character the worst nickname in the world. And I instead chose to focus on how Gyul would be hurt. Gyul was hurt because he knew full well that he was just going through a crisis. But there was no way he could admit it out loud. He was a gruff dwarf. And he kept that sort of business to himself. Sulk if you want. Boy. Gyul replied. I see footprints big enough to bathe a mule in. And I intend to follow them. Our DM didn't ask me if I had the track feet. Or even to make a survival check. Which I guess was just because the tracks of a giant were easy to follow. Gyul had made it almost out of sight of the ruins of the castle before Leperable caught up with him. Fuming. You don't get to make decisions without me. Understand he said. Glaring. I don't recall marrying ye. Gyul replied. You won't even recall your own name if I decide to slip you some green lotus poison. Leoperable said angrily. Or if I give you red lotus poison. You'll be dead in a second. I took a moment to wonder whether that was just a bluff meant to scare me. But ended up deciding it was best not to find out. We followed the tracks into a forest. And were then promptly ambushed by three dragons. My eyes grew wide as the DM described them. Since I knew full well that two fifth level characters had no chance against a single adult dragon. Let alone three. As I cursed my DM for not paying attention to appropriate challenge rating guidelines. I waited for him to describe what color they were. And my eyes grew even wider when he said they were covered with yellow scales. What the fuck is a yellow dragon? Leah Parabu didn't seem to be concerned. At all. I seem to recall that he had slain a few dragons in his backstory. Though I don't remember him saying exactly how he managed those feats. So, Gyul prayed and hoped that there was some amazing reason that Leopabu had managed to disregard all logic and defeat monsters that would likely kill him in a single hit. And that he would manage to repeat that featuring Tode. Leopabu, with the kind of tact that I expected from him, calmly shouted at the dragons, I've killed six of your friends, and if you don't get out of our way, I'll do it to you. I waited for the DM to ask him to make an intimidate check. Instead, the DM asked him to make a reflex save. The dragons all simultaneously released their breath weapons, a stream of boiling acid. A stream of boiling acid with arcs of lightning spiraling around it. What the fuck is a yellow dragon? The player shifted around atop his cushions until he managed to get into a position where he could roll his dice. With a quick toss and some mental gymnastics, he managed to get an impressive reflex save of 24 from a roll of a 6. Which was still a few short of what was needed not to get hit by the breath weapon. As the DM eagerly began to pull out D6 after D6 until his hands were heavy with them, Leo Perabu decided to reveal his family heirloom, the green ruby. Which would allow him to negate one attack against him. I frowned, but the DM simply asked how many times he could use it. Only once, he answered, though he sounded like he wanted to say at will, ignoring that it was actually three attacks that were hitting him. The DM allowed the green ruby to absorb all the damage. Shattering while leaving Leo Perabu unharmed. Gyul stepped forward, pleading with the dragons, dragons, we are not your enemies, and it would be a poor plan to make this man one, he has endured your deadly breath, and speaks no lies of besting dragons. We merely seek to pass, and if you don't let us pass, Leo Perabu added, I'll fuck you up. The DM considered all the dice he held in his hands again, an evil glint in his eyes, but he managed to resist the temptation, putting the dice down. He lazily said that the dragons flew off, leaving us to continue our quest. Feeling relieved, I smiled at my friend, who suddenly shot me a look of disgust when he realized something. We didn't get to loot them, lost a magic item, and we didn't even get to loot them Leo Perabu shouted, slamming his fist repeatedly into the ground. Consider it as pay for the toll, Gyul replied, and consider yourself fortunate you lost only that gem. Our quest continued, as following the giant's footprints, until the DM decided to throw goblins at us. 1000 goblins. 1000 goblins, loitering around in the middle of a path, just waiting for some adventurers to walk into them. As I tried to formulate some sort of plan, like finding some wall or cave to use to lessen their advantage of numbers, Leo Perabu ran forward, throwing out a fireball. Nearly 40 goblins died from that single attack, 
leaving us with only 9,960 goblins left to contend with. It was a trial of patience. The goblins could not hit Leo Parabu, not even on a natural 20 thanks to some magical ninja ability Leo Parabu had. So it just became a question of how long it would take for the half drow half ogre to kill all the goblins. He was basically a walking blender, taking down 8 goblins around through some collection of feats I'm certain he couldn't have, and sometimes 40 or so when he decided to throw down a fireball. All of this was being done without miniatures, relying on us to simply assume that every single 5 foot space around us was covered in goblins. Ghoul wasn't faring quite so well, he was cutting down goblins left and right, cleaving through them with his axe just as easily as Leoparabu was with his magic lightning scythe, yet, though he was tough and gruff, he was still being cut apart by the horde of goblins, and was genuinely thankful that most of their attention was on Leoparabu. Just as he managed to take down his 100th goblin, Ghoul collapsed from a dagger wound, fully expecting to die. Thankfully, wizard ninjas have access to healing spells, and he was back on his feet before he even had a chance to catch his breath. By the time there were only 200 goblins left, our DM had gotten bored, and decided to allow Leo Parabu to kill all of them at once with a fireball by having them all squeezed together in a 20 foot radius circle. With all of them dead, Leo Parabla started to loot them all, and received 1000 pieces of copper. Unsatisfied, he also ended up with 1000 pairs of goblins boots, 1000 daggers, and 1000 pairs of goblin ears. He tucked all of these away into a bag of holding. It seemed like the DM was ready for the big finale. We continued following the footsteps, until we stumbled upon the sleeping giant. The giant quickly awoke and stood, and was described as being over 400 feet tall. This meant that his footprints were probably so big and so deep, you could bathe an entire pack of mules in one. I'm pretty sure that the DM didn't realize this, but this giant was bigger than Godzilla. In fact, I'm pretty sure that the giant was much taller than Kanchaki Castle had been, which I didn't bother to mention because I was too busy trying to figure out how the hell we were supposed to fight this guy. Leo Peribu ran up and started stabbing the giant in the toe. He was ripping and tearing, while our DM described it as not even breaking the giant's skin. As Leo Perabu hopelessly continued to exfoliate the giant, the behemoth lifted up his club and slammed it down onto him. The DM just grabbed two enormous handfuls of dice, preparing to throw them all down while I stared in horror. Then, with a desperate look in his eyes, Leo Perabu revealed another of his family heirlooms, the blue ruby, which could agate one attack. My jaw turned to lead, dropping so hard I pulled nearly every muscle in my face. I turned to the DM, who frowned before putting down his dice. How many times can you use this ruby the DM asked. Only once, Leo Perabu replied, though everyone in the room knew that he was likely carrying a ruby in every color of the rainbow. The battle continued between Leo Perabu and the giant, with mountains in the path of the giant's club being destroyed while the rubies went through orange, yellow, purple, red, black, white. And he even resorted to using a diamond ruby. Even Leo Perabu knew he couldn't keep pulling rubies out of his ass forever, and Gul was on the verge of tears. Not because he was about to die, but because anyone with half a brain knew that rubies can only be red, while all other colors of Karundam are called sapphires. Then, I remembered. The red lotus Gul shouted, if ya think ya could poison a dwarf, I'm betting it could poison a giant. Leo Perabu stared at Gul, utterly confused without any clue as to what the hell the dwarf was shouting about. I stared at my friend in complete disbelief, not willing to believe that Leo Parabu had only been bluffing about carrying the poison when he had been carrying 9 magical bullshit rubies. Then, as if struck by a giant's club, recognition hit him. Oh yeah, girl Leo Parabu said, digging into his bag to retrieve the poison, but why do we need the giants to forget something that's the green lotus? You stupid Miss Begerton son of a monkey and a spider. Even with the red lotus poison in hand, we needed some way of getting it into the giant. Ghoul ran as fast as his short legs would let him, charging straight at the toe that Leo Parabu had so desperately tried to cut open. Swinging with his axe as hard as he could, he slammed it hard into the toe, hoping to draw blood. Nothing. The cull used toe would not yield blood, even though Ghoul could fell trees with such a hit. Thankfully, Leo Parabu at least knew when it was time to attack, and followed with his own strike. He kept cutting into the toe, but even with all his half-ogre strength and all his half-drow skill, the toe was beyond his ability. As he failed, our impending doom loomed above us, the giant's club soon to come crashing down to drive us deep into the earth. With death only seconds away, Gul took a moment to look around him. 
He had fled the mines that had been his livelihood, afraid that they would rob him of everything he had been in his youth if he continued to work in them. Now, he wondered if he regretted his choice to leave, as he would soon be nothing more than just another one of the craters that now covered the landscape. With sudden inspiration, he shouted at Leah Peribu. Lead between his toes, ya fool. It's our only chance. Without questioning his companion, the wizard ninja dove alongside the fighter, deep between the giant's immense and foul smelling toes. The club stupidly changed its course to follow, and the DM finally got his chance to roll all the dice he held in his hands. Bone splintered and flesh tore as the giant's toes were crushed by his own club, and I momentarily feared that we too would share in that damage. Thankfully, our improvised shelter held, and we managed to emerge unscathed, looking up to see the giant screaming in pain. Without hesitating, Leo Perabu ran to the big toe, with its cracked and bleeding nail, and slammed the bottle of poison into the open wound. With a flourish, he slammed his foot down as well, pushing the bottle deeper and breaking it, releasing its contents. As the giant slowly died, the poison taking its time to course up his veins and into his heart, I realized something. Even though I was playing with the worst player and the worst DM, I was having fun. Even though it had all been ridiculous, and could have easily been some sort of gaming horror story, by just allowing the two of them to have fun while they let me do my own thing as well allowed us to have an awesome game. The giant bellowed as the red lotus poison reached his heart, and fell over, his colossal body crushing a fair amount of the landscape. Feeling rather proud of our accomplishment, I smiled at the two in my group, and the two of them smiled back. In the hours that we had played, I had ended up reclining amidst the pillows and blankets, and had to admit I had grown fairly comfortable. To conclude our adventure, out of the sky three yellow dragons soared down, landing upon the giant's legs to stare down upon Leah Perabu and Gul. They explained that as we had slain the giant that was terrorizing the land, they were going to reward the two of us with 10,000 pieces of gold, and that if we wished, we could marry their daughters. Leaving me with only a single thought. What the fuck is a yellow dragon? Fuck me, now that was a good one. I really enjoyed it. And you know what the best thing about it was? It was just such a fucking mess. But because it was such a mess, that's just kind of what made it so fun, you know? And it was... It was very wholesome in a weird way, and, like, you know, it's hard to come across these sorts of stories, like, you know, that is just a steaming pile of shit, but it all works out in the end, and everyone had fun, and that's all that really matters, you know? I think a lot of people forget whenever they're playing, like, you know, D&D &D and stuff like that, or whatever, it's more about the actual, the friends you made along the way, <laughs> to quote in a better meme, but you know what I mean, um, I really enjoyed it, and it's just, it's fun. And I don't think you get this level of enjoyment out of a lot of other games because a lot of the time you're just min max and like you know, say for instance, like you know, look, I know a lot of you boys have probably played World of Warcraft back in the day, and it always was about min max and like you know, getting the best numbers, getting the best stuff, and being able to output the best numbers all the time. But sometimes it's not about that. Sometimes it's just about fucking about with your mates and doing what you like, you know. And I just really enjoyed it. So, look, um, let us know what you thought down below. I'm rambling a bit much here, so, look, I'm going to leave you and uh, check out the links, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye. If you haven't already, check out my Redbubble portfolio. You might just find something you like. Just stop! Just stop it! Stop! No! Just stop it! It's time to stop! It's time to stop, okay? No more! Where the fuck are your parents? Who are your parents? I'm gonna call Child Protective Services! It's time to stop!